Hello, everyone. Today, President Trump was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of his work in brokering an Israel-United Arab Emirates peace deal. It was a historic deal and the first such deal in over two decades. This is a hard-earned and well-deserved honor for this president. President Trump's foreign policy will always be one of peace through strength. And that is what the American people are seeing abroad. Career politicians merely talk about the kind of results this president has achieved on the world stage. End endless wars, we hear that often. Not too often do we see it actually done. Today, uh, the president and the Pentagon, the Department of Defense are announcing a drawdown of troops in Iraq, just announced from 5,200 to 3,000. We are getting our allies to pay their fair share. Now nine NATO countries are meeting their 2% spending obligations. We've secured better trade deals for the American worker. President Trump negotiated the USMCA, the US-South Korea deal, ended the Trans-Pacific Partnership, brought back manufacturing jobs. President Trump has stood up to China. The phase one China deal, uh, also tariffs to hold China accountable and actions to block Huawei. President Trump's also defeated terrorists. The ISIS caliphate is destroyed. Al-Baghdadi is no longer on the battlefield, along with Iranian General Soleimani. In addition to these priorities, President Trump has made peace a cornerstone of his recent foreign policy efforts. The peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates led to the first flight from Israel over Saudi Arabia's airspace to the United Arab Emirates. The signing ceremony for this historic deal will be September 15th at the White House. President Trump has also brokered economic normalization between Serbia and Kosovo, a major breakthrough in this decades-old conflict. It's a fact. President Trump has broken the 39-year-old streak of American presidents either starting a war or bringing the United States into an international armed conflict, as a great Washington Examiner piece headline read. These wins are possible because of the president's leadership and outsider perspective. President Trump addresses old challenges with new solutions and delivers results for the American people. And with that, I'll take questions. Paula. Haley, thank you. I'd like to ask you about the Woodward interviews. Did President Trump intentionally mislead the American people about the threat of COVID, a pandemic that has now cost the lives of nearly 200,000 Americans? Absolutely not. Um, this president, at a time when you're facing insurmountable challenges, it's important to express confidence. It's important to express I calm. To always play it down. Is playing it down. Is that is that expressing calm? It well, seems dishonest. It seems. Can like you read lie. the rest of the quote? That's how much they put in there. Oh, you excluded the last part. Um, we'll play the full thing on 60 please, minutes. Please, on do, do you deny please do explain. The please, of course I deny of that. Pandemic. And he makes clear that he doesn't want to see chaos, by the way, is the second part of the quote, which you failed to read. Um, the president, just days after having this discussion um, with Bob Woodward, said this from this podium on March 30th. He said, I do want them to stay calm. We are doing a great job. If you look at the individual statements, they're all true. Stay calm. Um, it will go away, but it's important to stay calm. So this president does what leaders do, good leaders. It's stay calm and resolute at a time when you face an insurmountable challenge. So That's what this president this case, has It will not appear that the president lied to the American public about the threat posed by COVID. The president has never lied to the American public on COVID. The president's been very, the president was expressing calm and his actions reflect that. Um, on January 6th, uh, the CDC issued a Wuhan travel notice before any confirmed U.S. cases, among another a number of other actions. And I'd refer you to Dr. Fauci, who said that this president has an impressive response. I can't imagine under any circumstance that anyone could be doing anything more. That is the record of this president. John. Kelly, but how do you, how do you square the, the president's words to Woodward when he said uh, this is a very delicate one. It's also more deadly than even your strenuous flu. This is deadly stuff. And then just two weeks after he told Woodward that, he said this is a flu. This is like a flu. Um, and of course, he also said it was going to quickly go to zero. But that, that, that seems to be in direct contradiction to what he told Woodward. Well, the president was listening to his medical experts because you also have at the same time period Dr. Fauci, who said this, um, asking, asked if the seasonal flu was a bigger concern. He said this on February 17th. So right now at the same time, people are worrying about going to a Chinese restaurant. The threat is that we have in this country. We're having a pretty bad influenza season, particularly dangerous for our children. So he was reflecting that point. And again, days later, 
in a briefing, he said, the statements I made are this, I want to keep the country calm. That is what leaders do, and that's what President Trump but does. But in that statement, Fauci is not comparing the two. He's not saying coronavirus is, it was like a he was at, It was a COVID interview, and he was asked about seasonal flu vis-a-vis -vis COVID, saying exactly what the president said. And in fact, the president was taking it more seriously because on the tape, he noted uh, that flu could be worse, and he was taking action to address it. Um, once again, context matters that zero reported COVID cases, the CDC was implementing public public health screenings. House Dems were preparing to file their first briefs in impeachment. One reported case, CDC, um, when there was one reported case, the CDC was activating an emergency operations center while Pelosi was releasing a statement criticizing McConnell over impeachment. On January 31st, the president issued a travel ban um, on China, one that the former vice president called xenophobic. That's what Democrats were doing while this president was acting, and his actions reflect the seriousness with which he took COVID-19. Yes, well, Jeff. You quoted Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci is also apparently on the record saying of President Trump that his attention span is like a minus number and his sole purpose is to get reelected. That's according to veteran journalist Bob Woodward. I think the bottom line here is that the president, by his own admission in private on the record, acknowledged the depth of this crisis and yet told the American people something very different. How is that at its core not an abject betrayal of the public trust? The president has always been clear-eyed with the American people. He was always clear-eyed about the lives we could lose. Um, again, from this podium, he acknowledged that this was serious back in March that 100,000, 200,000 lives could be lost. Um, and with regard to Dr. Fauci, you're referring to a quote he allegedly told Bob Woodward, and I can give you quotes that we can all play on loop and video of him saying that this response was impressive and he can't imagine anyone under any circumstance doing anything better. Uh, Dr. Fauci saying this, I can just tell you the president, uh, the first and only time I went and said, you need to do mitigation strongly, the response was yes, we will do it. The second time I went with Dr. Burks to the president and said 15 days to slow the spread are not enough, we need to go to 30 days. Obviously there were a lot of people who had problems with that because of potential secondary effects. Nonetheless, the president went with the health recommendation. So there's a long litany of praise from Dr. Fauci and you're referencing something he allegedly told Bob Woodward. It's, it's on tape. It's on tape, Kaylee. Well, I'm, reading, I'm reading to you what Dr. Fauci has said very publicly for all to see, and we can all play those video clips. I can get them in your inbox. President yes, Trump see. On February 7th says it's deadly stuff about coronavirus. In private, on the record. In public, though, February 28th, he says, one day, it's like a miracle, it will disappear. Well, it's, one it's, one, it's one thing to, as a, as a public figure, not to try to incite panic. It's a very different thing, respectfully, uh, to lie and mislead the American people uh, about, no uh, was, about a crisis no one, that has claimed nearly 200,000 American no lives. No one is lying to the American people. One day COVID will go away. I think we can all hope for that day. Uh, we will have a vaccine because of this president tearing through bureaucracy to get a safe and effective vaccine. One day it will go away. That is a fact. It is not inciting fear. This president has expressed calmness from this podium, mobilized the greatest mobilization of the private sector since World War II, uh, got more tests than any country in in the world on COVID, a vaccine, which by the way, it'll be a record for a novel pathogen. The timing of this vaccine, should we get it by the end of the year or should we get it even three years, which was the timing of Ebola? This president has done an unprecedented job dealing with COVID, um, one that Dr. Fauci even acknowledged. And like I said, I will get you that clip to your inbox. Yes. Oh, okay, Kaylee, uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago that this is an insurmountable problem. I think that that's a, quite a point of dispute. If you look around the world, the United States leads the world in, in confirmed cases, in, in deaths from COVID-19. So doesn't the president have bare responsibility for that record as well as the testing and, and the vaccine development that you're just talking about? Now, when you've looked at the rest of the world, um, in particular, the case fatality rate in the United States is about 3%. Uh, the world is 3.3%, the UK 11 0.9%, France 8.8%, Belgium 11.2%, and um, you can go through the various Western world countries that have dealt with COVID, and we've done a very good job. The case fatality rate notes that, and that's a testament to our therapeutics that's that the president has navigated. The, US is still, is still the case top. fatality rate is the metric that shows how well our response has done with therapeutics, and we are leading the world um, in having the lowest case fatality rate. It's a very important metric and one that's a testament, once again, to a president who ripped through barriers, getting from desivir convalescent plasma and other very good working therapeutics. You mentioned the president is very focused on, on, on the response there. Then why did the president have thousands of people, many not wearing masks at a, at a rally last night in, you know, in, in a state that has limited outdoor gatherings to 50 people? Why is he going to 
Nevada this this weekend to hold similar outdoor rallies, uh, to gather many large numbers of, uh, of people in violation of his administration's own guidance and of the best advice and guidance of local officials who he has said should have the final say in these matters. People have a First Amendment right, if they so choose, to show up and express their political opinion in the form of a peaceful protest, which is what um, the president held. And there's a real double standard here. CNN had on a guest, uh, apparently a doctor, uh, Rob Davidson, who said, now true, there are social distancing issues with regard to the protests we've seen around the country. However, this is a public health crisis. They are marching against systemic racism. So if you're allowed to march in aggregate um, in those protests, you're also allowed to show up at a political rally. You have a First Amendment right in this country. Have a responsibility to keep people safe. Mario. Um, how can the president bear no responsibility for the 200, almost 200,000 lives lost when he downplayed the virus initially and he knew that it, how contagious and deadly it was? I don't understand how that can... The president never downplayed the virus. Once again, the president expressed calm. Uh, the president was serious about this when Democrats were pursuing their sham impeachment. Uh, he was expressing calm and he was taking early action and his actions are reflective of how seriously he the, took COVID. The, the tact that he took, the language that he used, no, you said that he used hopeful language. Does, does he regret that given where we are now? No, this president embodied the American spirit that when we face a challenge, a crisis, a pandemic, uh, we come together, we can be optimistic, we can be serious about it, we can take it seriously with our actions, which is exactly what this president does. It's why we lead the world in testing, uh, doing far more than the number two, which is India. He took this seriously, but he still expressed calm. Uh, our food supply chains were at risk, that we could not have mass runs on grocery stores. Uh, the markets um, also, the economy was in play here. Um, we didn't want to, there to be a huge crash and panic. He expressed calmness from this podium, but he has always taken it seriously. And the response, an unprecedented response, really reflects that. Yes. Oh, thanks, Kaylee. Um, I wanted to ask you about the uh, AstraZeneca trial. So does that throw a spanner in the works that they've halted those trials in terms of getting a vaccine quickly? And, uh, and then I have a follow up. Yeah, so the AstraZeneca um, paused their trials. Um, Phase three clinical trial um, was a routine response when they, when you see an adverse um, effect. And it was one that shows that the science is guiding the way here. Um, and when there was an adverse response that was identified in one individual, AstraZeneca chose to, pa to pause that phase three clinical trial. There are still two American vaccines in phase three clinical trials showing great promise. Um, but you know, AstraZeneca, what is happening there is showing that the science is guiding the way on a vaccine, which is what Dr. Fauci, um, others like Alex Azar and the president have said all Long. So you're still confident that you'll see a vaccine sort of before the end of the year? By the end of the year is the goal, yes. And has that slipped though? Because there was some discussion about seeing something around the time of the election. So do you think it delays that? Our timing is not about the election. It is about saving lives. And by the end of the year has always been our goal. But of course, um, a safe and effective vaccine, we will take it as quickly as we can get it. Can I ask you a question on China too? So uh, the Customs and Border Protection was supposed to be announcing or said that they would announce a ban on, on imports of many products from Xinjiang province in China uh, as a result of the human rights abuses there against the Uyghurs. That announcement hasn't come formally. It was supposed to be announced here at the White House. Are you intending to make that announcement or has there been some backlash against just the breadth of it? It, it, does, it does encompass quite a lot of different products, including tomato products that, you know, yeah, I, I have no upcoming announcements about how we'll publicly um, talk about that discussion, but if I get more information, I'll let you know. Yes. Hey, can I ask you about Nevada, please? Sure. It's my understanding that the two rallies this weekend in Nevada have been canceled because of Governor Sisolak's order preventing events of 50 people or more. Does the president have a reaction? And what is the White House policy about complying with the state's orders limiting the size of an event. I have not heard that about the rallies, but I'd refer you to the campaign uh, for further information on that. But um, as I discussed um, with Zeke here, that we believe that if people want to show up um, and express their political views, that's their choice to do so. We hand out masks. We encourage um, individuals to wear those masks. A lot of people did. I was in North Carolina last night and saw it. Uh, we give out hand sanitizer, but at the end of the day, if you want to join a peaceful protest, you can do so. Um, and there's no, um, there's no reason, just like the protests we've seen in the streets, you can't show up and express your political view at a rally. Yes. Hey, 
Anyway, um, can you give us some understanding about why the president agreed to sit down with Bob Woodward for 18 interviews when his first book about the administration was so deeply critical? Because he's the most transparent president in history. Follow up. When, um, when do you expect that we'll get the list, the short list of who the president is considering for the SCOTUS picks? And what's the criteria that he's using to assemble that list? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you'll get that list in short order. Um, the president is very excited uh, to share who he would nominate uh, to the Supreme Court. And what will guide um, his choices are people who follow the Constitution. He wants Constitution abiding judges. He wants textualists um, who believe the words of the statue actually are what they are, not subject to interpretation. He wants judges guided by the Constitution, um, judges um, in the ilk um, of the two that he's nominated, like Justice Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. Yes. Thanks, Kelly. Um, did the president or anyone at the White House have conversations with the Department of Justice about their decision to intervene in the Ethan and Carroll lawsuit? And if so, what were the nature of those conversations? I'm not aware um, of any discussions that have been had. Um, the president has claimed he signed the most favored nations executive order on prescription drugs. He mentioned this again last night. Um, we haven't seen the text. Has he actually signed the EO? And if so, when will we see the text? And can you tell us what the status of negotiations are with Pharma? Yeah, so the um, the EO, I believe he's referring to there, is the previous one he's signed. Um, a provision of that was most favored nation, uh, which means that for Medicare programs, you have two ways to get prescriptions, Part D or Part B. Part B are drugs you would receive at the doctor's office. Uh, and the executive order tells the secretary to peg prices for Part B to a most favored nation price to make sure that American citizens are getting uh, their medications at a price equally um, as cheap as other countries. So that was the initial EO. I believe he was referring to, but any updates, um, I'll let you know in the upcoming days. Yes. Thank you, just, in re in, just following up on the uh, coronavirus issues, how is it not misleading for his advisors to tell him and compare this uh, virus potential to the Spanish flu of 1918, but then for the president to say that this could disappear by April? The president, um, again, was expressing calm. The president um, was hopeful that, you know, COVID um, would, uh, that, that we would be able to manage this and handle it in a way that we can make it go away as quickly as possible. And the president rose to the occasion um, and did just that. This was a lot more, I, by the way, it's worth mentioning, um, the misleading that the WHO and China did on this. Um, when you had the WHO, they were repeating China's claim that the virus does not transmit. This was a novel virus no one had seen. And you have the World Health Organization saying this virus, virus does not transmit readily. That is the information the uh, we were getting. Advisor, you had Pottinger, the white- O'Brien said that this virus could be the biggest threat to his presidency. Uh, Matt Pottinger agreed with that assessment. And then President Trump would later say that no one pr could have predicted this when his own experts were predicting this. Look, you're referring uh, to the uh, intel community, and they've what the president knew was, and I've walked you through this before, on January 23rd, the intel community briefed President Trump for the first time about COVID, and the briefing said, uh, coronavirus from China is poised to spread globally, but the good news is that it is not deadly for most people. This is the information President Trump was getting, and the next time he was briefed on it was January 28th, when he was told that the spread was happening outside of China and the deaths remained all inside China. He was told then that China is not sharing key data. Indeed, China was not, because as I noted to you on January 9th, uh, the World Health Organization said it does not readily transmit between people. And on January 14th, the World Health Organization said no clear evidence of human to human transmission. Clearly, that was not true. Um, even on February 29th, as the virus was spreading, the WHO uh, put political correctness first by opposing travel restrictions. Note that on January 31st, President Trump put into place those travel restrictions that Democrats called zero xenophobic. Shame on them. Yes. Thanks, on the same day the president tweeted that the virus would become weaker when the weather started getting warmer, he told Bob Woodward it was going to be deadly stuff. So why does Bob Woodward get the president's unvarnished opinion when the American people don't? The, he was giving Bob Woodward the same opinion he gave from the podium. And he said, I am here. I want to express calm. That is what a leader does. He has always shared the facts. He has always been forthright. And he's always followed the advice of his medical experts, like Dr. Fauci, who called his response impressive. Yes. He never said this was deadly stuff. Yes. The American people. 
Yes, he did. He acknowledged that hundreds of thousands could die, and he took the right response, which was to temporarily shut down the country, save millions of lives, and so too have his therapeutics, so too will the vaccine that's being developed. Yes. Uh, the protests in Belarus continue, as well as the crackdown on the opposition. What concrete steps the president is going to take to support uh, Belarusians in their struggle for democracy and to stop uh, human rights abuses? Yeah, it's a, another very good question. Um, the U.S. is extremely concerned by continued human rights violations in the wake of Belarus's election. Um, reports of op opposition figures being kidnapped, forcibly expelled, or otherwise threatened are just a few of the many method methods that the Belarusian government is using in its attempts to deny freedom of speech. The U.S. is working with our international partners to hold all of those committing these abuses accountable, and we call on the Belarusian government to release all who are being unjustly detained as for the election. The election there was not a real election. It was neither free nor fair. It was fraudulent. The massive number of Belarusians protesting peacefully makes clear that the government can no longer ignore the people's calls for democracy. Yes. Can we help the president keeping his promise of ending endless wars if this announcement on Iraq is just a drawdown, not a withdrawal? There are still troops in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. There's still troops. It's not really keeping the 2016 promise, is it? Um, the president's drawing down our troops. These things take time. Uh, we want to ensure that the Iraqi security forces are well trained, um, and the, our U.S. troops have done a magnificent job doing just that. We believe uh, that now is the time when we can make this draw down, uh, keep the country stable uh, because of the training that our, our troops have done. But so, do you have an attempt to kind of try and make it look like the promise is being kept in advance of the election? No, not at all. Uh, this is an expression that we believe that Iraqi security forces uh, can do this alongside the troops that will remain there. Um, and the facts tell the story that this president broke the 39-year-old streak of American presidents either starting a war or bringing the United States into an international armed conflict. So unlike past presidents, um, this president has prioritized peace through strength, which is his foreign so policy. Just one really yes. quick follow-up. Follow just really, really quick follow-up. Sorry. Just on the breaking the 39th year trend, how does that work if the president sent troops into Saudi Arabia? Chanel. Kaylee, thank you. Um, with Kosovo and United Arab Emirates, these are Muslim majority countries spanning two continents now, each bringing some kind of agreement with Israel towards peace. Um, so my question is two points. Number one, have the Palestinians uh, opened up any kind of discourse with the White House as to their reaction to these developments in, in with Israel and Middle Eastern countries? And number two, have the Palestinians actually expressed any interest in distancing themselves from Iran in the interests of Middle East peace? Yeah, through the deal, President Trump made additional progress on reaching peace in the Middle East. Uh, Kosovo and Israel agreed to mutual recognition and normalization of ties, and Serbia committed to moving its embassy to Jerusalem only a few weeks after the historic Abraham Accords between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. This is another huge step forward for broader peace in the Middle East and the rest of the world. I'd refer you to the Palestinians for their reaction, uh, but it is quite telling that this historic historic agreement between Serbia and Kosovo addressing a decades-long conflict was only mentioned one time on CNN and one time on MSNBC. Yes. Thank you, I want to ask about the uh, Winter Olympics in Beijing in 2022. Uh, more than 160 human rights groups have called on the International Olympic Committee chief to revoke the Games from Beijing. Uh, would President Trump support an American boycott of the Games over the Chinese re regime's human rights abuses? I haven't spoken to him uh, specifically on that, so I'd have to get back to you. Um, but this president has always held China accountable. His actions very clearly show that. Um, he has stood up uh, to the to China, um, unlike any president before him um, in modern history. But um, one thing um, I do want to address is um, just this really egregious, and I addressed it on Friday, but it's worth um, updating this, this Atlantic uh, story written by a liberal activist. Um, now you have 25 people who have spoken out and dismissed this story, and now you even have uh, the author of the story who said, quote, I share the view that it's not good enough, 
quote referring to the fact um, that he uh, did this false report based on anonymous sources. Um, and basically, when you look at um, the liberal activist who wrote this, he has a very bad history. Um, he can't be trusted. The left's new hero used to be their number one enemy for his role in the U.S. entry into Iraq. Indeed, in the early 2000s, uh, this author was then at The New Yorker, and he extensively wrote on the possible links between Iraq and al-Qaeda, a suggested link that was key behind the decision of U.S. involvement in Iraq. He relied on people who, in her, his words, quote, seemed to me to be credible, who said that they had information about such connections between al-Qaeda and Iraq. And Goldberg's reporting simply backed up his view that the U.S. should invade Iraq. Um, in Slate in 2002, this author argued in favor of the U.S. invading Iraq. And later, he even admitted that he knew people blamed him for helping to get the U.S. into the war. Uh, he wrote a sarcastic piece saying, yes, yes, I know I started the Iraq War. Uh, his reporting cannot be trusted, as noted by the fact that 25 people have come out on the record dismissing uh, his report, the report by a liberal activist. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.